Um, hello everyone, welcome to the show, welcome to this channel, this is from Sydney helping you to create the life that you want. And you know what, sometimes the life that we want to rebuild is the one after divorce. We do know that many marriages fail, and second marriages fail in up to 60%, and then third marriages fail up to 70%, maybe because people have not worked on the problems that caused the divorce to begin with. So it's important to tackle these issues as they show up. And as we are divorcing, which is a very sad event, I've been through it, a lot of people have been through it, it's terrible, but let's see what we can do about it. And I brought to you an expert today, and her name is Crystalie Lazin, and she comes all the way from Toronto in Canada. Hello. Hi, friends. So nice to be here today. It's good to see you here, and we're going to squeeze in half an hour all the nice tips and things to get you going through your divorce so that you don't collapse completely and you don't have the same issues again. But of course, let's start first with a problem. So what is the, what are the two or three main problems that happen in a family? So children, teen, adults, and the parents, what happens during a divorce? So during a divorce, there's a lot of unresolved problems and conflict within communication of partnerships and the people involved. So there's a lot of unhealed trauma that they brought into the relationship and, you know, it manifests itself in ways that are either beneficial or start breaking down the relationship. So when people leave it unresolved or don't notice what they're actually acting or behaving like in the relationship, they show it in strange ways, like, intense arguments or maybe even violent acts, but it starts to manifest in ways that are very unhealthy for the whole relationship and the whole family dynamic in itself. So something that I really like to pinpoint is that the communication breaks down between both individuals and the length of time and chaos that's happening throughout that um difficulty, that difficult time in their life, that starts to evolve and expand and break down the relationship where then, you know, they end up having to either decide to separate or divorce or people go to couples therapy. But what's missing in between is getting that really one-on-one help for themselves to really work out a lot of the underlying issues that they've brought to the relationship, plus all the ones that have been created in the relationship. So these start creating that, what we now know is generational trauma for the parents involved, the couple, um, the children as well as, as well as perhaps even their legacy that they bring afterwards, it starts extending further and further, the less it gets addressed. So what I really like to point out is that a lot of people during this time, their self-confidence, self-esteem starts breaking down their level of worthiness and how they feel about themselves and life breaks down. And that starts at childhood. And these children in these divorced families are just looking for acceptance. They want to please the parent. They want to show that they are worthy of being accepted. That's just their natural innate ability and and the way they operate as a child. And so when parents have these chaotic environments that they live in, the child feels less and less important in a sense and feels more in in tune with, well, why are my parents fighting? What have I done? And they start internalizing a lot of the, the difficulties for their own self and start blaming themselves for why the family's falling apart. So there's so many layers to the end result of divorce that it's really important to look through all those layers and peel back and really sift through them to see where all the root causes created these programmings of how people are behaving and reacting and responding in relationships, but more so how they feel about themselves. Yes, I think it's correct. The way we feel about our capacity to love and to be loved and to succeed in society has a lot to do with what happened in the family. So how our parents or step-parents treated us, how that made us feel, even if they had the best intention. Maybe we feel in such a way because we had past trauma before 
And not all parents are perfect. Some parents cause issues to their own children. So the next step parents coming in, even if they're amazing, they're still there kind of shadowed by this past person that was there that caused the issue. And so unless we talk about it, and we're both doing RTT here, rapid transformation therapy. So we know very well that, you know, the majority of the cases, Marie Zapiro always says, if people arrive there, I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm just never going to be good enough for anyone. I just, I have no confidence. I can't do it. And this happens to so many people. When you see them, you know, some people will join gangs. Some people will be anxious. Some people will be not loyal to anyone. Some people will be stealing. Some people will be just sad and depressed. Some people will throw themselves into study. We all have a different way, positive or negative. But can we do something about this? Is very hope during such a traumatic event, such a disease, a divorce. What can we do? Yeah, for sure. And children take on those roles, like you said, the care, the perfection individual, the nurturer, um, and the person who's sick all the time. So in order to do that, really drawing awareness to your personality type and what's going on around you and within you, a lot of times our emotions are not really reflective of how we're thinking and feeling inside. And in order to do that, you have to really be aware of how you're feeling and get in tune with that. That's the first step. And know that there is help out there and available to you if you seek it, but finding the right help that can really help you on that deep emotional level and really release that therapeutically will help you then start reprogramming your conscious mind because your mind has been going down these highways of thought and feeling for quite some time. So it's very familiar with feeling upset or depressed or not lovable and so on. So the more you've traveled down them, the more difficult it is to release on your own. But being aware of what you're feeling and what you're thinking and how this event has affected you and had a domino effect on you certainly helps then decide, okay, what do I want? How do I want to feel? How do I want to use this situation to liberate my life rather than, you know, suffocate my life? And so having that general idea of really having a clear picture of what you want and how you want to feel will then give you that motivation to find someone that can help you really liberate from this situation. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. It's a great point, and I wanted to add something. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, there was an episode from a Huberman Lab where Andrew Huberman was interviewing um, a person that I think it was a psychologist, a lady psychologist, and, and they were talking about trauma, and they were saying trauma is not what happens, but what you perceive about the event, whatever it is. Even holding a hot potato could be traumatic if you get burnt, you know? And um, yeah. and the thing they were saying was this, to cut it in, you know, it's very, in a nutshell, it was if your parent is there understanding you during the traumatic day and telling you, I believe you, I know it feels bad, but let's see it in this way. For example, let's say that your dad, who is now living in the family, has been yelling at you today, but he was having a bad day. It's not about you. He was just having a bad day. So putting this in perspective from a neurobiology point of view helps us to make sense of it so we don't register this as a traumatic event but as one of the things of life that nobody's perfect we become a little bit more mature well life isn't just as good sometimes but instead of storing it as a big thing they will block us later we don't know what it is we thought that well this happened so i'm just gonna let it go and trauma is different because we don't let it go isn't it it's just there yeah yeah absolutely and just something i'd like to elaborate too about the traumas, we can lessen that trauma for, you know, the children involved too, if you're the parent involved, explaining to them, you know, what life will look like after this relationship has dissolved and give them a really clear picture of what that is because they're they're fearful of the dynamics changing so drastically yeah. that they're not sure what to expect. And obviously you're not psychic, so you can't really either... Uh, expect certain things either, but you can at least frame them to let them know that they're loved. It's not their fault. There's going to be life after this, and this is what it'll look like and paint a really clear picture in their mind to help them understand the changes that are going to happen. Yes. And what happened then in second marriages? 
or third marriages, when people have been traumatized with new parents all the time and then they grow up. And what, what are the feelings of these children and teenagers as they see new sets of parents? And even if it's not divorce, could be parents living together with a partner. It's still the same thing. Somebody else in, is in the house. Yeah, definitely. So how, sorry, I just want to say, how do we tackle that? <laughs> sorry. Yeah, definitely a lot of resentment is held there. And resentment is an accumulation of emotions that have that you're going through and have been unresolved. So the longer that resentment stays, the harder it'll be to accept a new parent or a new individual in the household, the harder it'll be to even move on from the destruction of your own household. So letting go of what that thing that's causing constriction or causing you to feel contracted is going to help you be able to accept the new but because you're still holding on to the old and the past feelings, you won't be able to find the silver lining in the new or be able to see this person for who they are. And yet you're bringing your own judgments because of the narratives that you're following and the situation that you've experienced. You're still holding on to the old narratives. Yes. And it's hard to admit it, isn't it? Because we all hate change. We don't want to be hurt. And Absolutely. We want to protect ourselves. Yeah, definitely. And definitely in like a, a, a situation where families have blended, it's hard to really accept the other person. Perhaps there's been some infidelity and this is the person that's now coming into the family due to that. There are definitely going to be challenges, challenges with that. So it is certainly your job to take responsibility for how you feel about that and work through that on your own. Yes. So when there is a small child who can't really grasp that, it's really the job of a parent there to step in and say, okay, I'm so sorry. I think it didn't work out with your mom, your daddy. But now we're going to have this new different family. I hope you can understand, you know, I was not happy at all. I, I couldn't do so. I think it just sitting down and talking you know, yeah. probably one of the big things and, and ask what you want and how do you feel about this? So let's let's pretend that you have a person right there now and their own parents are going through a divorce. What would be your tip? Let's say they were like 16, you know, just a number. <laughs> so they're aware, they're not children anymore. They're not quite adults. So what would you suggest if they did? Because, you know, emotions are a lot stronger between 12 and 18. They're like, <sighs> and so it's a little bit, it felt differently, isn't it? Because the whole life changes and maybe... They will have to go and live with one parent somewhere while the other parent might be a hundred miles away. So their life changes, their, their friends disappear. So how, how do we talk to the teens who might react really badly? Absolutely. And I think it's important to acknowledge what the, is important to the teen and also acknowledge that they still have a childlike mind as well. And we all as adults even have a childlike mind, but we learn to to push that down and, and be this adult person. So I would talk to them just like how I would talk to a child to paint a very clear picture in their mind, what life will look like. You still will have your friends. Yes, you're going to be able to live both at uh, each parent's location, but it's going to be amazing. You'll be able to have two rooms and decorate them how you like and be able to have all these extra people supporting you and surrounding you and really shower them with kindness and love and support and let them know that they are loved and reinforce the fact that you will be there for them twofold now as a single parent being able to support them in this way and their other parent would be supporting them in another way so making sure that they are emotionally reinforced by speaking directly to what they love and what they value in their life, whether that be friends or certain hobbies or things that are really important to them and making sure that they know that all those things are still reinforced and you'll be there to be that supporting backbone for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what about the case? I'm just thinking about every single case that comes through all my uh, case history. Um, let's think about this one, uh, which is mixed between four different clients. And so two parents, one cheats and then moves in with a person that maybe has already children. And the other person has their own children. And these children have to spend time in this house with this new person 
who is very biased again about one of her parents because what they heard is the story like oh terrible but actually it was not true and so this child goes from one house to the other hearing two different stories and this mm. happens a lot so when a parent the parents have not created a really good relationship but they created a nasty problem there by talking on the back and being overly critical and diminishing the ex. How do we help a child who hears different stories all the time who might be conflicted because they they love both parents? Definitely. And as a child, you can't tell the difference what's right or wrong. You just let it all in. And so as you evolve and grow as an individual, as an adult, you will bring those perceptions with you about whomever. And so when you open up your mind and open up your awareness to this individual, if you can allow yourself to see past what you do know and what you believe you know, and see past that and really look at this person as an individual, probably already going through different hardships in your own life as well, you can have a certain level of compassion. But before you get to the compassion for that person, you have to acknowledge the things that are going on within yourself that that person perhaps inflicted the pain upon you or your perception of that individual and how that affects you. And once you start working through that and letting that go, you can harness compassion for them. But that's because you've given yourself compassion first to work through the challenges about that. Yes. Compassion is a great thing. And perhaps there isn't much of it in today's society. That's my my idea. I think it's always, you know, something I always hope that if people have to divorce, maybe it's a good time to look at mediators because they will be so helpful and unbiased in turning down those heated emotions so that you are really thinking about the the good outcome for the children who are going to be suffering because you guys are going to rebuild a new life. But the children are stuck in a really difficult, treacherous, emotional mess and they need to have support. And I think when people are able to mediate with a third party, they can kind of cool down and say, okay, I don't have to be, I know I know that it feels like, oh my gosh, but he's done that, oh, but she's on this. So you have his anger and the shock is, is all there. But the mediator is just very calm and say, all right, let's think about the child. What is the child going to want? And that is so helpful. So I wish that everyone had that. But from what I hear, mediators can be quite expensive, but it might help later with lawyers' expenses because if you are litigating all the time, you're going to end up raking thousands of pounds or dollars for your legal fees because you keep having new argument. But if you mediated before, you might actually reach an agreement and not fight so much. And, and I think it's that constant fighting that kills the children and the teenagers self-esteem because they they can't understand if a parents cannot resolve this how can we do it absolutely yeah, yeah i totally am on board with that quite a big thing isn't it um have you got any more tips of wisdom before we close this amazing interview yeah i just want to encourage people to draw their attention inward i know sometimes it can be scary i know it's really hard to look in sometimes but just Work on that through even journaling because journaling creates a connection between our left and right brain hemispheres. And that then gets translated onto paper to be the, our, our most authentic thoughts in its real form. So I really encourage journaling to really tap into that inner self of your own self to really discover what's going on and do some self-discovery work. What I also really want to encourage people is to be your own best friend. I think we're very harsh on ourselves when we go through these situations because we feel like we're a failure or we carry shame with the with the word divorce or we have these negative connotations and self-confidence issues with ourselves based on what had occurred. So I really would love if people would just be their own best friends and write some powerful statements and truths about yourself and even challenge them. So I am statements are very powerful because they're encouraging for our own self. And it indicates to our brain that I want to be this other person. I am this person that I'm stepping into. And it reinforces to the mind more and more to be and act like that person rather than your old self. And last but not least, I'm a huge person on just getting as much support and help possible 
I think any kind of support, any kind of help is necessary and all helps in these micro doses. And so hypnotherapy, of course, I'm a huge advocate for that because I see the most transformation through that by working through the mind. However, there's so many other things that people can also engage with and, you know, seek other means like naturopathy or homeopathy to help heal the body and really work through that. Or, you know, breath work, which is something that I'm a huge proponent of. I love doing breath work. I just did it right before we recorded this to find my inner alignment. And so I really enjoy these things and I partake in them, which is why I'm suggesting them. And self-care comes after you start caring about yourself. And that means starting the therapy process so you can give yourself the care that you require. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I just wanted to add a quick comment and on this because the one thing that really helped me through this that happened many years ago now, but it's keeping as much as possible a good routine of self-care. So I kept going to the gym. I kept listening to my music. I kept doing my exercise, kept doing a lot of stuff that was a habit because when you have this baseline, your body is not as shaken as it would be if you suddenly have everything crashing down there. So you have to keep as much as possible in mind that you have a body and a soul that needs to be nourished even during the divorce and especially during that so that you can not be a complete mess but have something to look forward to every day, something to be grateful about every morning when you wake up. And it's really tough to be happy during the divorce. It's really tough. But you can just, in the morning when you wake up, say, hey, I can feel my feet. I I have nerves. I can feel the nerves. I'm not paralyzed. And that's um, something that some people in the world don't have. They don't have legs or they cannot feel the legs because they had a stroke or something. And, you know, it, health is a great thing. And we can always say, All right, I, I can walk. I can talk. I can go to a group today and talk to some people and I can have a tea with somebody. So look for something positive nourish yourself every day and remember you cannot feed anyone if you have an empty sack yourself you have to feed yourself and you really need it during the um, no i'm talk not talking about food anyone i'm not saying i'm not suggesting to start emotional eating <laughs> that's not what i'm saying do not misunderstand <laughs> but nourish your soul for me uh, reading the scriptures praying for people who don't maybe breath work and could be something like that but it's so important to really take stock of what we are about and then once this is done start thinking about okay what do i actually want to see in five years from now what do i want to achieve where do i want to be and with that plan once the shock because some divorces are shocking because of discoveries of cheating and drugs and addiction and whatever after that you know the, the the big dust will settle and then we have to say okay what now and then we slowly prepare for change and change is something that we really fear but sometimes we are a little bit like those little caterpillars and we've been there hiding for years and after the divorce some people shine and they extend beautiful wings and they fly away because before they couldn't so that's a beautiful metaphor thank you there's always hope for us to be able to fly again and morph into something even better than we were before because we have learned a huge lesson about life, about pain and healing and love, and especially for children about keeping solid for them so that they can have something to, um, you know, to rely on and somebody who will listen to them. At least one parent has to be there. But hopefully in all divorces, parents will not be so selfish and will think about both kids, but this is not always the reality. So, absolutely, yeah, sadly. Um, so thank you, Crystal. It's been so good to talk about this topic with you. Thanks so much for having me, Franz. I'm so glad to be able to share this with everyone and having me on your show. Yeah. Well, it's always so good to have you. And of course, people can look up your uh, address, email address, whatever that we're going to put up as a description so they can find you and have some hypnosis or RTT or advanced conversation hypnosis, whatever to go forward in their journey and heal. And the same is for me. I offer exactly the same. And you can just ask us any questions and um, consultations are free. The first one is free. So you can just 
see if you resonate and see, well, yeah, I need some help. And some people don't invest in themselves, but I think in, in the divorce, this is actually what you really need to invest in yourself so you can come out victorious and feeling better and then move on. Instead of being resentful, go be an addiction and destroy your life. You can actually thrive even after a divorce. It's a promise, I've done it and I'm getting married again soon. So yeah, it is possible for everyone else. So thank you again. And um, everyone, if you like this episode, maybe you would like to share it and click like as we do on YouTube and on Lipsyn and iTunes, etc. And maybe somebody else who's having a really hard time will be able to have a little bit more hope. Thank you so much. And I'll see you all next week. Take care and bye-bye to all of you.